For the longest time, video games had only ever been about attaining a single goal, to thrill the player, usually in the form of being fun. Now, how that fun is expressed is going to differ based on genre. Horror games and visual novels may not sound inherently fun, but how their systems and players engage with one another can help bring about unique moments, be them in game or in real life. Got him! Oh, that was so cool! I love this crossbow! Not every player is going to walk away thinking the same thing of a game. The witness may have compelling puzzles where solutions are told through mechanics and environments, but to some that may not be as fun as pulling out pen and paper in an effort to decode a number system, converting them from base 13 to 10 just to solve one massive puzzle. But just as some players may prefer those puzzles, some may be more into twitch shooters or action titles where skill is put at the forefront of the experience and the players constantly being pushed into enhancing their skills in order to overcome obstacles, especially on higher difficulties where players may find tactics once highly beneficial to them being stripped away. But no matter what the genre, we're playing games to be entertained and hope that by the end of the experience we walk away satisfied. Perhaps even so satisfied we want to hop right back in and start all over again. Normally that's not a problem, and for the larger part of the PS2 era of gaming it wasn't. But then the seventh generation of consoles happened. At some point during that transition of across generations, games started to become more cinematic than previously observed. And it's really where the indie developer scene started to boom in popularity thanks to the rise of digital downloads being able to offer cheaper games with bigger returns, much more than they would have in physical media. Now, stories had always been integral parts of video games since their induction near the early 80s, but before they simply served a contextual purpose, meaning their only real cause was giving the player a simple goal while also making the world feel logically cohesive. Doom, back in the 90s, served as an example of this philosophy, with John Carmack even being quoted as saying story in a game is like story in a porn movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not that important. But as the years went on and story did become increasingly prevalent, even in his own titled Rage, it became a major focus. If I gave you the original Super Mario Brothers and removed the goal of saving Peach, there wouldn't really be a reason to play as there's no goal for the player to shoot for. There is the goal of shooting for a larger score in a game like Tetris, but I doubt many would be willing to accept just that, so it's best to have both and it's a simple solution to a large problem. Some of the greatest fights in film, television, anime, and games come about as a result of proper story implementation, when the viewer recognizes something is at stake and the resolution to it will come about as a result of battle. If things aren't handled properly, it's incredibly easy to shatter the audience's suspension of disbelief. It's why certain bosses in games, when handled poorly, feel like a letdown because because it doesn't match the context provided by the narrative, or it may go against the basics of game design by turning the fates of certain characters into trivial matters. Even in anime, sometimes the story is just the context for why certain fights happen the way they do, especially in more battle-driven series like Bleach or Dragon Ball. But once the player finishes the game, the purpose of the story has been served, so the player can engage more deeply with the mechanics of its systems. But lately, the mechanics of games have started to take a back seat to the story, which isn't necessarily a bad thing the first time through, especially if your story is good enough to carry the player the entire way through it. It's afterwards, when the player chooses to engage with the game a second time, that designs begin to fall apart. With the shift in console power, developers were able to make stories and games a lot more interactive than previously seen. And while moments like this aren't particularly new, dating as far back as Shenmue and coming into prominence with Resident Evil 4, perhaps even Grand Theft Auto 3, their integration has become a lot more noticeable, and developers were quick at exploiting such possibilities. But the effects of this integration have provided for less than stellar experiences. To serve as an extreme example, if I handed a group The Last of Us along with Devil May Cry and asked them to play through each, chances are most would tell me the former was a far better game than the latter because of the story. A second go around might have the player noticing details they'd missed and make them appreciate it more, but by the third go around I can assure more people would begin to tell me that Devil May Cry was better. They might even want to go back and play more thanks to its incentivized skill-based play and its ranking systems. The whole game is streamlined to accommodate for this. Anything akin to a cut 
cutscene or QTE is initiated by the player, so the player always has the same level of control. The reasons for this shift are simple, stories are static, they can't be enjoyed as frequently as gameplay where the events almost never play out the same way. It's always offering something new which runs against the idea of scripted gameplay, where agency is not only lost but involves no skill whatsoever. Both Devil May Cry and The Last of Us have chapter select and theater modes, in order to cater towards people only seeking the story or mechanics, but in the latter's case only fans of the story benefit as those scripted moments are still left in the gameplay. What's worse is when levels are built to accommodate for these moments, making them feel more like an afterthought where no one really bothered to see if it worked during actual gameplay, such as with the sky and Skyward Sword. Odd considering forced walking goes against the language of cinema, often being show don't tell. Nothing visually or mechanically important is happening during these moments. While the player might be in control, only the story is moving forward, not the gameplay, so these moments effectively boil down to voice acted sequences from a visual novel. So as a result, this becomes no different than this. Exposition may not always be avoidable, but the act of having a character state they're not emotionally ready for something instead of showing they aren't dumps hours of work time on developers and it only creates a weaker scene. The devs are working harder, not smarter. Needless to say, if someone is jumping to a certain chapter just to play it, he isn't looking for the story. If he was, he'd be using theater mode. Including multiplayer only serves to make the campaign's gameplay look worse by comparison, as it sheds light on overused and unnecessary padding. Such features exist to only lower returns and garner sales, but not everyone wants to play online, so a clash of ideology appears. Online multiplayer ensures that there will only be a short span of a few years where players can get the most out of a game. Once the servers shut down on a console game, they're likely gone for good, meaning the campaign is all that's left. No matter how fun the mechanics may be, returning to it for more gameplay at this point will only make those story beats all the more intrusive. If a design aspect or trope exists that only worsens the experience the more it's seen, it's best to exclude it or mitigate the problem. If Metal Gear Solid 5 can do it, then surely every game after it can too. If these tropes do die, then their forced inclusion will only be made all the more jarring as time goes on and easy to label as bad game design. It might be arrogant of me to say this, but this is why I find that the heavily gameplay driven Dark Souls is regarded as an instant classic, where the Uncharted series isn't. All of Dark Souls multiplayer functions are built into the single player, so even without servers the player will still be able to get the full package. Put simply, it's a timeless experience. Devil May Cry is similar in that regard, hence why I can feel confident asserting that it's better than The Last of Us. A weaker story, perhaps, but undoubtedly more enjoyable, even after 8 years. If you've seen any of my previous videos, you'll know that I think stories in standard games are an important part of their design, and it can help push a game from being simply good to outstanding. Most of the time, if a story is good enough, it can help pull me through an otherwise standard gameplay experience. However, I am a firm believer that this facade only lasts the first time through and should have no bearing on the the actual quality of the gameplay or player interaction. To put my views on stories in games simply, story is only ever important once. A good narrative on bad gameplay is a bad game, but a good game with a bad story is still a good game. But I still don't think that's reason to skimp out on the narrative and fail to offer something greater. Games are a multi-purpose medium. They can offer unique stories with diverging paths, versatile gameplay, and different methods to approaching any given scenario. In most situations, the player is given the tools by which they can create their own optimal gameplay experience, even when the game is creating a funnel to push the player along. It's very rare when a game actually asks for the player to only approach gameplay from a specific playstyle, and often it's for side content meant to push the player's skill. But outside those instances, the player is free to play as they see fit. No one says Metal Gear Solid has to be played as a stealth game even though that is its core theme. No one is discouraged from stopping the flow of Journey's gameplay to stand around and draw butterflies in the sand, and no one is saying you have to play Zelda with a shield despite how beneficial official it is. There may be consequences for a more reckless playstyle, but it's the player's prerogative to do so if they see fit. No two people will ever approach a game from the same angle or mindset, no matter how hard the developer tries to make them. So it's especially annoying when players are forced to play a certain way for the sake of the story instead of building up the gameplay. In The Last of Us, there's an instance where Joel needs to be caught by an enemy so Ellie can fire a gun and advance the story. Instead of being allowed to stealthily take down enemies, the game keeps spawning them to 
until Joel is caught, reducing the moment to little more than a game tutorial built for the AI. The story is so important the players drag down from their skill level for something negligible and taken out of the experience. Compare that to the Tales games. Certain enemies, usually bosses, are built to have an overwhelming advantage early on so that the player will lose. This enhances not just the story but builds the player up to wanting to defeat them later on, and eventually they can, sometimes with ease. But as this lacks any importance in a repeat playthrough, the grade reward systems make it possible for them to be defeated. If anything, it makes the experience all the more satisfying when done this way. It's through the player's interactions with a game's systems that they're truly able to make something unique and special. Perhaps moments the player will remember more than the actual story or pre-scripted boss fights themselves, even if it's because of some arbitrary reason. So it's important from a game design standpoint to never break the flow of interaction with those systems, or at least you think it would be. Comparing Majora's Mask to The Last of Us, the two detail the rights and wrongs in game design, along with how far it's come in recent years. The most noticeable improvement being skippable cutscenes, a feature absent from both iterations of the former while present in the latter. It exists to better the flow of gameplay and decrease player frustration come repetitious moments. But the most jarring downgrade is the overabundant focus on story. For many, the narrative and atmosphere of the elements Majora's Mask does just as well as The Last of Us, perhaps even outclassing it. Yet it never restricted the player for arbitrary reasons. It was always conveyed mechanically, so even while parts of the story had already played out in a cutscene, its effects on the player hadn't. It was still an active experience. And you can see this most prominently in the moon and time mechanics. Crude, maybe, but undoubtedly effective. And developers have used similar tactics since for more impactful drama in their stories, seeing as that drama happens during the gameplay. Meanwhile, the opposite is true for The Last of Us. The story largely happens away from its mechanics, and once a scene ends, the effects no longer remain on the player, and it becomes just another shooter. Yet it still fights to integrate narrative and gameplay through heavily scripted segments, often walking. But this only creates a passive experience that serves neither, while sacrificing both as a result because the developer doesn't want the player missing the story. To an even greater extent, Bioshock Infinite does the same, having virtually no cutscenes at all, instead opting for heavily scripted moments of gameplay, the consumer must endure every playthrough. Some could say they're fun the first go around, but no matter how memorable they may be, they'll eventually lose their impact on the player, and upon repetition they'll become dull moments in between gameplay. Even in games like Virtue's Last Reward, the player has the option to jump to certain events just to witness their unique cutscenes, and if gameplay is necessary to that choice, if the player has already solved a puzzle in the room beforehand because of how they're structured, they can completely ignore the entire chamber and just input the answer, since it's pointless to solve the same puzzle twice. It might sound odd considering this video is about story intrusion in games, but when the roles of gameplay and story are reversed in genres like visual novels and point and clicks, I find it appropriate that so are the approaches to their mechanics. I can see the rebuttal to my complaints over the story intrusion in The Last of Us and Bioshock Infinite, being that they're interactive movies so the gameplay shouldn't matter, but it fails to realize that there is even gameplay in the first place, especially in the former where it's been cut out and placed into its own little multiplayer mode, specifically for those that want to experience more of it. Clearly, the developers tried to make a game that was both well told and enjoyable to play, but it becomes such a large juggling act that it becomes hard to ignore when it drops the ball when other games do it so flawlessly. This is just my opinion, but it seems that as time has gone on, the perception of what it means to be perceived as a mature gamer has changed. Before it meant to engage in realistic and bloody games, usually shooters, but now it seems that unless your title is trying to be philosophical or heart-wrenching, it's not mature, nor is it art, so no one will want to play it. I doubt I'm alone in this, but I've never managed to make it past episode 3 in any Telltale game, and that's due to the poor engine and controls. It's especially annoying to replay a chapter just to change a single choice and being forced to endure cutscenes and scripted gameplay just to accomplish one simple task. Yet despite these mechanical flaws, people still praise the games if only for their story and accept them, just as many praise Bioshock Infinite and Dear Esther despite theirs. It's this defeatist attitude that lets developers know we're fine getting a mediocre gameplay experience so long as the story is good, or in Infinite's case, appears good. At its core, it seems people who enjoy a good story mistake their enjoyment for actual joy in the gameplay, and it's ultimately what's led to games being in their current state. I may have enjoyed that Dragon Cancer and Firewatch, but I can't say I'm eager to return to them 
and I likely never will be because they don't feel good to play. Their value as a game is lost the minute the credits roll, but at least games like Steins Gate and the Zero Escape series offer multiple scenarios to keep the player invested and the gameplay is built to support it. If I ever want to play a certain scenario on Firewatch, I have to start a new game and trudge through it far enough just to get to that point. I'd rather just watch it on YouTube. If the title in question isn't more engaging to play than it is to watch, then what's the purpose of it being a game if it's not taking advantage of the medium and instead is acting as a bunch of set pieces? These games clearly aren't built to support more than a single playthrough, yet they include features and challenges encouraging multiple returns without changing the level design and scripted events to streamline that experience and make it as enjoyable as possible, meaning the player is forced to endure long, drawn-out sequences they no longer have any investment in, all just to play a small section of a game and accomplish what they set out to do, be it finding all the collectibles scattered throughout certain levels or just pushing through the game's higher difficulty. So the flow of the game is constantly being broken as the story impedes the player's progress, because the game is too afraid of letting the player be in control out of fear that they might ignore certain scenes or story beats and break their immersion, and it keeps that mentality each time through. It's bad enough that these segments can often be dull or unengaging, but there's no reason to add fuel to the fire as it creates more problems than it solves. But the topic of immersion versus gameplay is perhaps best suited for another video. Cause holy frack boss, this video is long. It's disheartening to see that so many of the titles that fall under these faults belong to Sony, and that's likely because of the highly successful Uncharted series, which focus primarily on providing scripted thrills rather than mechanical ones. And this design philosophy has spread into more recent titles such as Killzone, The Order 1886, and even now God of War, and the trend looks to continue with Horizon and the debatably unnecessary Days Gone. But the few Sony titles that have managed to avoid all these issues are Ico, Shadow of the Colossus, and most of all Journey. Journey is one of the rare times when gameplay and narrative truly come together. It's not a perfect title and my only fault with the game is you can't skip the minute long cutscenes, but otherwise it comes damn near close. Outside this minor nitpick, like Majora's Mask, Journey makes it a point to exploit the mechanics of video games to more effectively tell its story, all through the scenarios the player finds themselves in, relying only on the player's perception of reality to create the context and fill in the gaps. Narrative downtime is at a minimum. The player is pushed along a single linear path with multiple things to do in each area, but they are never punished for choosing to go explore or go through the game at their own pace. Anytime something needs to be conveyed to the player, it happens mechanically, be it harsh winds, companionship, horror, death, and even rebirth. It's all conveyed so well through those mechanics that I can't help but feel confused when games continue to model themselves after film rather than the model set up by Journey or Ico. Games with a heavy emphasis on story have the potential to be something greater than the film's developers seemingly want them to be. They are a unique medium with unique quality systems and storytelling methods. Scripts, let alone words, aren't necessary to impact the player emotionally. It's all about how the events of the game are conveyed to the player that will make it stick with them, and games like Journey and Majora's Mask have proven to be far better experiences than most narratively driven games in recent memory, and that's all due to how interconnected their narratives and gameplay are. Some might even say that they're better than most recent films. It's time we stop trying to hinder games' potential and experience for the sake of being cinematic or faux art, because as things are now, we're only getting worse games. Do we as gamers really deserve that? I don't necessarily think so. I'm sure some will argue that if I don't like games like this, why even bother playing them? Sure, the statement ignores that you have to play something to know if you like it or not, but it's because at their core there's a good game to be had. It's just surrounded by monotony that shouldn't exist in the first place. The importance of story and gameplay is always going to differ based on the individual. What works and what doesn't is subjective, you might even disagree with me because of it, but when the two merge in a manner where they're at odds with one another, it can prove for a less than enjoyable experience, even if you're there for both, and especially so on a subsequent playthrough. Games have reached a point where their stories have become so vital to the experience, the gameplay has become stagnant because developers want to focus more on it than making a good game. Thankfully for this, we have the indie scene, which is always providing a breadth of new gameplay styles, genres, and ideas, ones that AAA developers would be too afraid to tackle themselves. Some even manage to tell better or at least more intriguing stories than their AAA counterparts, and I think this can best be seen in just how popular they've become. This year's biggest indie title was No Man's Sky, a disappointing game for sure, but one that had a gameplay concept that made millions 
eager to play it. And next year's biggest release is looking to be Breath of the Wild. And nearly 99% of everything shown regarding it was gameplay and how unique and original it was, while pushing both open world games and the action adventure genre forward. Believe it or not, people still want to play fun games, more so than they want a good narrative that's only entertaining every few months or years when most of the original story has been forgotten. To serve my example, The Last of Us sold 8 million units, a huge success, but Skyrim sold nearly 22.7 million. Beyond it, Mario Kart Wii, a game with no story, sold 36.38 million. Cinema isn't a perfect medium for storytelling, so there's no reason to imitate it to the point we already have. After all, no one writes novels like their films. For every great narrative, there's a bad one, and making games cinematic rarely adds to it. If anything, it further exemplifies their flaws. When visual novels, a genre many people don't consider to be actual games are handling their mechanics better than actual games, somewhere down the line the developer has reached a fundamental misunderstanding of game design. Perhaps I sound like a traditionalist, wanting to play games and complaining about a lack of well-founded design. But just as what worked in the Atari and NES era still works today, so does the same for any form of entertainment. Anytime a game is praised as a masterpiece, I can only think of how much better the experience would have been if those heavily scripted sequences and instances of padded out gameplay hadn't been there. If games were simply roller coaster rides and the player had no agency whatsoever, I doubt they'd be as popular as they are today. They might not even exist if that were the case. Trends die for good reasons, and perhaps we're in a golden age of gaming, still experimenting heavily to see what works and what doesn't. And perhaps we just haven't realized it yet while still thinking that era was two decades back. I only hope that in 20 years we aren't looking back and wondering where it all went wrong as we continue to be complacent with current trends having cemented themselves as fundamental game design. The point of this video isn't to make you dislike these games, but to make you more critical of the medium and aware of your impact on the industry. That way we can get better products. The day games stop being games and truly become nothing but interactive films posing as such are the day games truly die. Hello, thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. I hope you enjoyed your time and tell me your thoughts in the comments, especially if you disagree. Sorry for the long wait, I accidentally deleted the video at one point and had to remake it. Uh, the channel has a Patreon and my Steam wishlist if you ever want to support it. Patrons are going to get videos a day or three early based on cheap donation prizes. It's like one or two dollars. Check out the Twitter and Facebook pages for more too. I try and keep people as up to date as possible on there, mainly on on Twitter more than Facebook. Kudos to Josh, Greg, and Roy for assisting with the script, and a major thanks to Matt who helped me make the video a lot more concise. Check out his channel if you want to support him too, as he's about to start making much more serious content in line with what I do. And thank you so much for watching, I'll see you next time. Much love.